Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, Intel's 8th generation core desktop processor launch, 6 CPUs, 1 motherboard chipset, and amazing gaming performance. 4 core i3 processors, 6 core i5 processors, and 6 core 12 thread i7s. This is one of the most important Intel CPU launches in 10 years. For the first time since 2007, we are getting more than four cores on the consumer level desktop processors. The Core 2 Quad in 2007 is the last time that we saw a core count increase from two to four, so this is a big deal. Now I'm gonna briefly cover the i3 and the i5 processors in this video. They will get more coverage in the future, but I wanted to dedicate and focus my time on the i7 flagship launch. It's sort of the premier product of this entire launch, and I wanted to do a lot of different benchmarks Benchmarks. Later in this video, I'm going to show you a lot of benchmarks, both gaming and non-gaming, overclocked and stock speed, and then talk about what that CPU is for, who should buy it, and what you might want to consider upgrading from. To go along with our new CPUs, Intel is releasing the new Z370 chipset new motherboards will be required. You will not be able to use 100 or 200 series motherboards with the new 8th generation chips. There's actually several very good reasons for that regarding power delivery, core count support, overclocking, high-speed RAM, and so on. There are some new features besides just the new chips and the new cores. Likewise, you will not be able to use 6th or 7th generation core processors on 300 series boards, so it's a clean break from the past. Please note that everything discussed in this video today will be linked down in the video description below to both Amazon and Newegg. If you found this video helpful and useful to you, please use those links when doing your shopping. I would greatly appreciate it. Now the i3 and the i5 CPUs launching today each have a K chip and a non-K chip. The K chip means they can be overclocked when installed in a Z370 board. The non-K chips cannot. The i3-8100 is a 3.6 gigahertz, four core, four thread CPU for $117. That is a really good deal. Now the 8350K is a four gigahertz CPU, but with appropriate cooling will overclock to about five gigahertz, and that's just over $160. Moving up to the i5s, we have an i5-8400, six cores, six threads. Now it runs just over $180, and runs at a base of 2.8 gigahertz with a turbo to four gigahertz. That is worth looking at in the future, and don't worry, those, will, those benchmarks will be coming up soon. If you wanna to go to five gigahertz on six cores and six threads, then you want the i5-8600K. Now it has a base speed of 3.6 gigahertz with a turbo to 4.3, but again, it's a K chip, so it is unlocked and can be overclocked. That runs about $250. Each of those four CPUs is interesting in their own right, and they really each deserve their own video. And so the i3s will get their own video and the i5s will get their own video in the next two weeks or so. But for now, we're just gonna look at the two i7s. They're actually very similar. The i7-8700 and the i7-8700K. They both have six cores and 12 threads. The non-K chip has a base clock speed of 3.2 gigahertz and a max turbo speed of 4.6. The K processor has a base speed of 3.7 with a max turbo speed of 4.7. But the more interesting number is the all core turbo speed because those top turbo speeds are on one core only. Both processors have an out of the box all core turbo speed of 4.3 gigahertz on all six cores. If you are not going to overclock, the non-K chip may be worth looking at. It's just over $300 and it includes a cooler. Now it's a fairly basic cooler, but for stock speeds, it should be enough. For about $55 more, you get the K processor, which will easily run at five gigahertz with appropriate cooling. Now it does have a slightly higher single core turbo, but that's not really why you buy it. You buy it to overclock. Now, as I said before, at the end of this video, I'm gonna have benchmarks both stock and overclocked on that processor so you can see the difference between the two. When you look at those benchmark results, keep in mind that if you're not going to overclock, the stock numbers that I provide you are also the performance you would get out of the non-K processor running at the out-of-the-box configuration. A couple of quick points regarding the motherboard platform before we talk more about the CPU. Now, there are a number of changes besides just the fact that you need a new motherboard for the new 8th generation processors. 
40 PCI Express platform lanes, 16 direct to the graphics card from the CPU, and now 24 to the chipset and your other devices. That is an increase of 10 over 7th gen. That is a nice jump, which is why you're going to see more boards with three four or even five NVMe solid state drive mounts because of all those PCI Express lanes. Per core overclocking is new. Memory latency and timings can now be adjusted in Windows using Intel's extreme uh, tuning utility without a re reboot required. And DDR4-2666 is now officially supported. Although frankly, anybody buying this, that doesn't matter because DDR4-3200, 3600 and even 4000 are supported on almost every one of these boards and some of these boards support beyond 4000 as well. Now regarding overclocking, Intel's new 14 nanometer plus plus improved manufacturing process really comes into play here. Now that might sound like marketing but my experience says it's a very real thing. I see temperatures under 70 degrees Celsius overclocked to 5 gigahertz on all six cores and 12 threads on this Dark Rock Pro 3 Air Tower Cooler, and that is a dramatic improvement over the seventh generation KB Lake. I've run my i7 7700K at five gigahertz and often see temps over 80 degrees Celsius. I'm seeing average temps closer to 65 degrees Celsius at five gigahertz on this platform. Now, Intel tells us they have changed the power delivery. The die is completely new on uh, Coffee Lake here. They have altered the way the chip is made in order to allow higher overclocks at lower power draw. And I am seeing the result of that. So if you're wondering, can you really get five gigahertz? Is that reasonable? Are the temperatures crazy? It is absolutely reasonable and it was completely 100% stable. 1.35 volts in the BIOS, 5.0 gigahertz, minus three uh, AVX offset, and that's an important thing because if you're using AVX instructions, which most people don't, you do have to bring it down a bit. But in those conditions, 65 degrees Celsius on that cooler all day long. Who should buy an i7-8700 or 8700K? Anyone who wants the best gaming experience, bar none. The fastest frame rates, the smoothest performance, this CPU is that. If you're looking for between 100 to 144 frames per second in pretty much any game with an appropriate graphics card, if you want to live stream your games to Twitch or YouTube with great performance, do you want to do some video editing, video rendering, or YouTube work, this would be an excellent CPU and great choice for doing so. It is the fastest desktop experience you can buy. With its high clock speed, high per core performance, six cores, 12 threads, and the current most advanced consumer desktop platform available, if you want the best, you've come to the right place. All eighth generation core processors include an integrated graphics chip. If you either don't want to add in a graphics card or perhaps need to go without one for a period of time, the nice thing about the Intel series is all of them come with an integrated graphics chip. Now you may not choose to use it, especially if you're buying an i7-8700K, but it's there in case you need it. And then finally, the motherboard mounting holes for coolers has not changed. All existing coolers dating back to 2011 will install perfectly fine in any of the Z370 boards because the mounting holes have not changed. The final thought that I want to offer before we jump to the benchmarks is my initial setup experience. This has been one of the smoothest, easiest installations ever. No BIOS updates were required, no drivers had to be downloaded and installed. I put the CPU in, put the RAM, turned the machine on, put my Windows 10 USB thumb drive in, installed Windows 10, everything worked the first time. When I overclocked it to 5 GHz, everything worked the first time. Zero crashes, zero problems. This has been the simplest, easiest system setup of a brand new platform that I think I have ever experienced. It is a mature platform. One of the biggest selling points of this and one of my biggest recommendations is if you want an easy setup, if you want an easy to configure, easy to run machine that doesn't cause you a lot of troubles and doesn't force you to run around after drivers and BIOS updates, Intel's eighth generation Coffee Lake is that platform. And with that being said, let's go to the benchmarks. The first benchmark we're going to look at is Cinebench R15, multi-threaded benchmark. We get 1432 at stock clock speeds, 1655 5 gigahertz overclock. This is impressive. 
A Ryzen 7 1700 at stock speeds is just slightly slower than this processor is. If you overclock a Ryzen 7 1700 to 3.7, it's a little bit slower than this. Now it's faster at four gigahertz, but not by much, about 1750. This is incredible performance out of a six core 12 thread processor that is holding its own and even beating a Ryzen 7 1700. The next test is CPU-Z's built-in benchmark, single-threaded and multi-threaded. I would like to point out that most of the tests that I'm running are free to download. Download Cinebench R15, download CPU-Z, run it on your current computer and see how it compares to these. In upcoming comparison videos, I will show you the results of various CPUs, both Ryzen as well as older CPUs, the FX8300 series, and then older i5 and i7 CPUs going all the way back to the i7-920 from Intel. PC Mark 10 is a free to download benchmark. I strongly encourage you run this if you don't mind spending the 20 to 30 minutes that it takes to run. The purpose of this benchmark is to do a complete Windows system test, image editing, document processing, spreadsheets, video conferencing, a little bit of video editing and rendering is included in here as well. This is the total system score taking into account all the various components of the machine, but it's primarily graphics card and CPU bound more than anything else. 7-Zip is a file compression decompression utility. I separated everything out here showing you the compressing, decompressing, and total figures both stock and overclocked. This test tends to be very memory speed bound. This demonstrates where the DDR4-3200 really helps. One of the tests I plan to do coming up soon is to show the difference between 2666, 3200, and even DDR4000, and this is a great test to show the benefit of higher speed RAM. 3D Mark is a 3D graphics benchmark. Unfortunately, this one is not free. If you don't own a copy, fair enough, but I will show you these results in upcoming future comparisons. Firestrike shows by far the biggest increase of overclocking due to the fact that it's more CPU bound. The Extreme and 4K test, as well as the uh, DirectX 12 Time Spy test, are mostly graphics card bound. Even with a GTX 1080 Ti, it's the graphics card holding back these scores, which is why you see so little difference there. VR Mark's virtual reality test. If you want to build a nice VR machine, this is a good one to do it with. The Orange Room is sort of the current standard. That's what current games are based on. And you can see a fairly decent benefit to overclocking here because the CPU is a large part of it. The Blue Room is sort of a future proofing test and it is completely and totally graphics card bound. Even with a GTX 1080 Ti, the extra CPU speed does nothing because it's sitting around waiting for the graphics card. The three Uni engine benchmarks shown here, the Heaven Valley and Superposition test demonstrate what graphics card bound results look like. The Superposition especially, it is completely, absolutely, totally graphics card bound. Faster CPU doesn't make much difference here. This is why the GTX 1080 Ti really is the right graphics card for this CPU, because in many situations, even at stock speeds, we are completely limited by the graphics card, not by the CPU. This is also why if you really only care about 60 frames per second gaming, you don't really need this high-end CPU. A Ryzen 5 1600 will do the job, but if you want higher frame rates and you've got a great graphics card, then the i7-8700K makes a lot of sense. Next, we have 1080p high detail preset eight games tested. Now these were all tested with the game's built-in benchmark. I will have live gameplay tests over on Tech Deals Gaming Up very shortly for you. But this is a quick way to test eight different games at three different resolutions, 1440p and 4K in just a second. And I will test these using the built-in benchmark against Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7, and the older i5 and i7 CPUs very soon. Some of that testing will show up here on the main Tech Deals channel. Some of that testing will show up on Tech Deals Gaming link down in the description below. Be sure you subscribe to that in order to see all of the comparisons. Now I'm not remotely going to try to read all these numbers to you. You can certainly see them for yourself. The blue number is the max, the green number is the average, and the red number is the minimum. The reason why there is not 1% and 0.1% lows, built-in benchmarks aren't long enough for them to make a big difference, and it's much quicker and easier to simply use the game's built-in benchmark results. 
I will have 1% and 0.1% lows on the live gameplay videos over on Tech Deals Gaming. Here you can see the 1440p high detail results. Now the games are in the same order to make it easier to compare them, but the order has slightly changed in terms of fastest to slowest. At the 1080p, I had them ordered uh, slowest to fastest based upon the maximum frame rate. Here the, sh the order gets shuffled around a bit, but I left the games in the same order to make it easier to compare. Notice that at 1440p detail, every single game averaged over 100 frames per second. Most were over 144 frames per second. So if you've got a 1440p 144 hertz monitor, this is what you wanna buy. How about 4K? Yes, you absolutely need a GTX 1080 Ti for 4K gaming, at least for modern AAA games. And not all of these games are brand new. Rise of the Tomb Raider and The Division now are more than a year old. Rainbow Six Siege is kind of on the border there. Grand Theft Auto V does great at 137 frames per second. High detail, 4K. Yes, full screen anti-aliasing was turned on there. Ghost Recon Wildlands, 62 frames per second. 4K is very punishing. In general, I think 1440p is the sweet spot, but if you want to do 4K, here you go. Well, there you have it. Tons of benchmark information. I hope that was useful and informative for you. There will be comparison videos where I show side-by-side -side numbers with various platforms coming up with the i3, i5, and i7 CPUs. It's simply way too much to put into a launch video, but I will dedicate a lot of October to producing those results, so be sure to be subscribed to my channel to be notified when those come out. Speaking of which, like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with that big button directly below. Questions and comments in the comment section. And as always, check out the links in the video description. Links to Amazon and Newegg for everything mentioned in this video. Links to my Twitch, Twitter, and Patreon accounts are down there as well. If you found my video useful and helpful and would like to become a direct contributor, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.